Hello and welcome to Gorgeous Gardens. Here's what's coming up on today's show. In a moment, we'll be visiting a beautiful garden in East Lothian. Expert gardener Tom Lee will be back with more top tips and everything will be coming up roses with Alistair Urquhart. <laughs> Gorgeous Gardens has come to Glasgow and we're starting off our tour at the Botanic Gardens and here to tell us all about it is the curator Paul Matthews. Hello Paul. Hello there. So tell me a little bit about the history of the place. Well the gardens came here on this site and opened in 1842. Prior to that um, the gardens already existed but further into town near Socky Hall Street. So what were they set up for? It's to do with the, the study of plants, presumably. It's a, a living museum of, of plant species, um, well labelled and presented. Mm. And today we, we function as that, but also in many other forms as well. Because I know them as being like physic gardens, where people wanted to understand what the use of plants was, the medicine and the, the function. That's right. A lot of the botanic gardens have an apothecary's origin, where they were, as you say, used as medicinal herbs and, and the like. But it's broadened into a, a, a much more um, far-reaching sort of uh, a series of, of uh, in activities now. What kind of things? We really sort of look upon ourselves as being everything to all people. We're a leisure centre for people that just want to take in a nice sort of environment that's open and, and plenty of trees and grass. Yeah, come to sort of get a bit of air. That's right. Well labelled plants, people that are keen on horticulture, um, even conservation areas which we encourage further out from the main body of the garden. Enable us to uh, let the wildlife you know, succeed well, because we're on the edge of a wildlife corridor with the River Kelvin running into the centre of Glasgow. So we have a, a fairly sort of broad uh, remit in terms of, of uh, what we do. And do people have to pay to get in? No, we're free and we're open every day. So it's very much a part of what the people use the city for to come and... That's right. We've, we've been in a, a municipal botanic garden since 1891. Mm. So we're very much a, a people's garden. For people who really are interested in the plants, what is there to see? There's a lot of trees. We have nearly all the native tree species of Britain, as well as exotics and introduced uh, specimens. Colour from uh, things like roses or um, spring and summer bedding, herbaceous borders, and a very fine greenhouse collection, including three of the national collections. Oh, really? Which ones? We have uh, the National Tree Fern, Dendrobium, as part of a much bigger orchid collection, and the National Begonia collection, which is a, a very large and important collection. Oh, I'll have to have a look at those. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I know you've got some amazing buildings here, because there's some behind us. The site's a, a Grade A listed site. The, the main range that's behind us now um, originally was put there in 1842 when the place opened. Mm -hmm. The Kibble Palace that's away behind us on our left uh, was put in place in 1873. Was that originally put in for plants? No, this was originally uh, a public auditorium for public meetings and people like uh, Disraeli and Gladstone gave addresses to the public when they were in, in the city. Really? So it's really almost quite a political place? Uh, at times, at yes. Did you ever have any marches or protests? Oh, there was even marches when the, the suffragettes were, were active. There were even uh, presentations in here for their uh, movement as well. Really? So it's got an incredible history. It's been linked and, and very much, as I say, a people's garden. It's, it's got a lot of involvement with the people. We have uh, quite a lot of visitors. It's difficult to know how many because we don't charge, so we've got no tickets. But, mm. um, for instance, the halls of residence for the university on one side and the university itself on the other. So we get a, a, a daily movement of people through the garden on, on their way into town or into the university. Yeah. Students. And how does it fit in? Because there are a lot of botanic gardens in the UK, indeed, and there are in the globe, all over, aren't there? Oh, yes. How does it fit in in the context um, of botanic gardens? Sort of well, there are probably over 90 botanic gardens in, in the British Isles, and not, no two of them are, are exactly the same. They all have their, their own uniqueness. Mm. So um, we are, as I say, a, a major municipal botanic garden with quite large glasshouse collections and a strong commitment to education mm. at all levels. Really? Um, we do a lot with um, young people and school parties, but right through the age groups, right up to adults. Can you actually do courses here then? Not courses exactly, but we do a lot of tours, we have a lot of horticultural societies, school visits, um, 
and I say, you know, we take guided tours around. So mm. there's a lot of involvement there to explain all aspects of, of really plant life, environment, horticulture and so on. I should imagine it's a wonderful place to bring children. It's very good. We have a small play area, but there's there's plenty of room for them to move around and to, to run off their, their enthusiasm yes. and you know and enjoy and themselves. And discover, see a lot of the plants which maybe they eat on a day-to-day -day basis and wouldn't even know about. We have economic plants, but also tree trails, and you know can actually try and and get them enthusiastic for wildlife. And, well, and I'm plants. certainly feeling enthusiastic. I can't wait to have more of a look around. Thanks very much, Paul. It's okay. Now I'm off to go and see a superb walled garden. <laughs> Now, I've come to a garden that most of us would give our eye teeth for. It's a very special old walled garden. It's like 100 years old. And it's laid out in a very formal style with box hedges and yew. But it's infilled with beautiful cottagey plants like delphiniums and roses and scented sweet peas. And I've come to meet the owner, Sarah Ward, on what we hope is one of the few dry days of the summer. It's been a month since we've seen the sun. <laughs> and uh, the wettest summer that we can remember. Taking its toll on the garden. Yes, some of the plants have gone over very, very quickly, and others, like the iceberg roses, just are incredibly slow Haven't to come out. Haven't even come out. So you're deadheading the geraniums. That's but a good idea, now they've gone over, to get them back into flower later? Yes, that's the idea, that if you take off something that's gone over very quickly, like, like a geranium, a hardy geraniums, they hopefully might, if we get a hot August, they might flower again. Mm. But they look a bit, you know, they look a bit rag and taggy like this anyway. They do. So they're better I mean, when they're taken off. It does off. quite often work. I mean, if we're lucky and we have a late summer and you just leave the crown of the plant on, it could work. But um, these box hedges, beautiful way of having a garden that's very soft on the inside but not lacking structure. They were laid out like this a long, long time ago. I should think probably in late Victorian times it was originally sort of set out as a formal garden. Um, we've redone the herbaceous to make it sort of more cottagey and, and soft but the box hedging must be everybody always says work. it's wonderful but it's such <laughs> hard work. So you're out here with your shears most days. Well it's just been cut and it very often dies back unfortunately like this it looks it looks tatty it's great. It's but like it comes animal, isn't it, it comes again very quickly it's like but it's pet. hard work. And these hedges they sort of got the shape as the shape of the house here the way the house is castellated. Yes it, again it's probably late Victorian and it's always been, as far as I know, a castellated yew. Mm. And it divides, it's very much exactly halfway through the wall garden. It's a division. So this is about 100 years old, this hedge. It's very thick. It's <laughs> wonderful because you get such a tremendous sense of enclosure and privacy, which so many people crave. And you get the smell, you get them, especially after it's been raining, which it just has, you get this wonderful smell from the box and the herbs and, and the roses the honeysuckle. and the honeysuckles. And that in the evening, when people come, it's very often the first thing they say is, gosh, what an amazing smell. Mm. Um, do you use the garden for entertaining? Yes, we do. We have it, uh, it's opened under the garden scheme and we have various, occasionally people ring up and say, can they bring a party of people around? And we love showing it, love showing it to people, but we're not professional gardeners. We're very much sort of, you know, we just do it for love. Mm. It's a family it, garden. Which of, the, which of the plants are your particular favourites? I mean, the, you've got a lot of roses. I love the roses. Mm. I mean, the, ro the trouble with the roses is that if you try and keep a garden as organic as you possibly can, the problem with roses is you very often do have to use chemicals because right. they go, they but get I've this black in spot. in Scotland that your roses seem to be really quite clean here. Is that just my imagination? But they don't seem to have many fungal problems or black spots. Well, I, that's nice of you to say so, but they are, <laughs> they do. You do. They have, I don't know what they're like in the south, but the supposedly roses are at their best sometimes at the side of a road. Yeah. They get less problems from exhaust fumes. Really? Uh, don't ask me why, <laughs> but they do. But uh, you've got lots it of... It is. I mean, that, that, that is just, I think that's absolutely beautiful. Um, Such a soft pink, that Yes, rose. very soft pink. Lovely. And then we come then, through. Well, the, all this end of the garden has been laid out in different shapes. So there's a circle and a rectangle and diamond and square. And this is Pat, who does the garden with me. We do it together as best as we can. Hi. And she's always loved gardening. Oh, this is just lovely to have a cottage. Did you actually lay this out yourself? Yes, we redid it. It was one great big rectangle, and it was actually terribly difficult to garden, so we divided it with small paths so that it's easier to get into things and keep it under control and neat and tidy. Because the one thing about a wall garden, like this, it's, and it's attached to the house, is that uh, if it isn't tidy, it looks ghastly. Mm. Is this your particular uh, specialist area, Pat? Well, I do a lot of work here, yes. <laughs> I do like this garden. I like the 
artichokes, I think they give you satcher in the garden and there's herbs for cooking. Yeah, and I mean, those use. artichokes are gorgeous. Of course, they get a lot bigger than that, don't they? Yes. Well, those are the, they're a different kind, there's those different two. In kinds. fact, that one shouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have to change. Why shouldn't it be there? <laughs> because it's not the same as the other three. We're gonna, that one is going to have to be changed. That's the same, that kind, and I don't know the difference between them, but you can see that's got that's a totally a different, different type of leaf. It's got a much, yeah, much, yeah. much yeah. smaller so these leaf. Are, well, what kind is this? Is it the kind you would actually take that head off to eat? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. But everything... Just about Ooh, everything lovely. in here hey, you should that, be able to eat. Is that ready for eating now? Yes. And ha what, what actually is, what type of artichoke is that part? That's the globe artichoke. And um, how would you cook something like that? Boil it. Ask the king <laughs> the cook. You, boil it. <laughs> you boil it, you snip off the <laughs> tops here yeah. and, and take it, basically you cut off the stem and yeah. you boil it for about, until the, until the leaves, you can pull the leaves out and you chew the bottom of them, take the leaves out and chew the bottom of them and then inside there's a little heart. Yeah with horrible sort of spiny things on. You have to remove the spiny things, but the heart inside it is absolutely delicious. Do you find you get many pests in this part of the garden? Well, we had a rabbit. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Not a lot. Not so long ago, really. but not, otherwise not too oh. bad. And do you sow everything from seed pads? Yes, I do. Spring? But it's been a very funny year with it being so wet. Mm. I, I love these ruby chard here with these bright These are lovely, yes. Stems. And they get a lot bigger they too. They get a lot Yes, but if they had the sun, you see, they would be... be they should, be, they should, should be, be up at this height. Mm. I mean, it has been the most extraordinary summer. It's just so We wet. have the yeah. white chard and... The red well, I have to say that despite this awful summer, you've both made an absolutely beautiful garden. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank Not you, sure. Pat. Hope you've enjoyed that. Now it's time for a break, but do join us afterwards when we're going to find out about Millennium Roses. <laughs> Welcome back. Now we're going to find out exactly what roses will be growing in the 21st century with Alistair Urquhart. Hello, Alistair. Hello. So hey. these are a particular kind of rose that we're all going to be growing in a few years' time, are they? Well, they should be available next year and they really are a very exciting prospect for the rose growers throughout Britain. These are what is known as the Millennium Selection, a selection of roses from breeders from all over the world the top varieties which have been selected, which I think will be eminently suitable for the 21st century. What's, what's, give, what's uh, made them eminently suitable? Well, they're all very, very healthy. This is one of the things that we're concentrating on now. Breeders of roses, the most important thing is health, so they try and get a really healthy rose so it will give people pleasure in their gardens without too much work. Mm. And I think all of these sort of fulfil that particular category. Any that particularly strike you? Well, there's one or two of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult question because I just love roses, I like them all. They are beautiful, but, there's a but, beautiful display. <clears throat> but this one is a, a really nice one, it's for Childs of Achievement Award. It's called, as you can see, Child of Achievement. It's a lovely yellow, and it's isn't a, it? As with all of them, they're all mm. associated with some organisation so that they can very often benefit from the spin-off of the publicity for the rose. Uh, there's one there for um, leukaemia, there's another one for um, Ray of Hope, for which is a charity for the Leukaemia Research Fund. And the Sunset Boulevard, that's one that I've heard of. Sunset oh, Boulevard Did it win an award? is a particularly good one. It won the Best Rose Award of the Royal National Rose Society last year. It was a top rose, the President's International Trophy Award winner. And we've been growing it for a year, and it really looks an absolute winner, this one. Mm, it's, it's an association with the Royal National Rose Society, this particular one. Where, what part of the garden would that be suited to? That would be suitable for anywhere, in a mixed border or in a bed. People tend not to plant them in, in you know, regimented beds nowadays. Mm. They're tending to mix them in with the borders. And this is a rose with this brilliant colouring that would be eminently suitable for that particular purpose. It's a lovely salmon. And so they've, got, they've got such lovely names as well, like Little Rascal here. Little, little Rascal, <laughs> believe it or not, is with a charity for hyperactive children. Oh, very so appropriate. So it's really appropriately named, and it's a very, very nice rose. Uh, what about that? That looks like a smaller one. It's a smaller one. It's growing only to about two feet or thereabouts. So that would be good for a pot? Eminently good for a pot or a, a tro um, tub or anything like that. Or the smaller gardens of today. Yeah. A lot of them are very small nowadays, so therefore they're very, very suitable for the small gardens of today. Because a lot of people don't even have soil, do they? Well, now, pe I reckon pe people don't have gardens, so they can no. grow them in balconies and things like that too. This is lovely. This is another one that's good for a pot, is it? 
This is a very good one for a pot. It's probably the best selling rose in cultivation at the moment. There's more of this rose sold than any other single rose in cultivation. It's called Sweet Dreams. Oh, that's nice. It was a rose of the year several years ago and it's really reached the top of the popularity stakes. And this is one that's quite healthy too. It's a very healthy. You can look at it. Look at the nice yeah, foliage. It's lovely. Very, very little disease. And this again is what they're concentrating on in roses nowadays. Does it flower but, for a long time? Because on all summer. Excellent. That's, that's what you the want, the beauty of it? the patio roses. They keep on blooming and blooming, repeating all the time. Now I know, Alistair, that you've done a lot of um, exhibiting at shows. So you must have lots of tips for us at home that want to take cut flowers like in the vase here I mean, what, what 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 should you do is there a good time to cut it and how you should cut it well the thing to do is not to cut it in the heat of the sun try and cut it early morning or late at night mm -hmm. and if you want a rose to last a long time in water you want it to take up the water yeah therefore a very important thing is to cut with a good sharp pair of secateurs yeah and then one of the tips which the flower arrangers passed on to me is that you boil the stems in water. Right. You put it into water for 20 seconds and take it out of the boiling water and then put it immediately into the cold water and you'll be amazed how well that rose will last Excellent. thereafter. Now I know this is a rose you particularly like, Corsa, and it's not in commercial cultivation it's anymore. It's not any longer in cut commercial cultivation, so I'm afraid if I want to reproduce that one, I'll have to bud it myself. Right, so you're going to show us how to do that? Well, it's really quite uh, quite easy. It just takes a little bit of practice. I've brought along a, a stem of it uh, just to show you for par uh, exhibition purposes. And this is a process called budding? This is a process called budding or grafting. And uh, I have a budding knife here. But you can use a, a Stanley knife or anything similar, a, any good sharp knife. And all you do is you cut the leaves off, just leaving the leaf axle like that. You go in above the leaf axle, you draw your knife along underneath the bud yep. and pull it away. Really quite easy. And then you flick the wood out, leaving that small embryo bud just there. Okay. You trim it down to shape and then we have some briars which I brought along. You scrape them clean. You make a T-shaped incision in here. This all looks very skillful. And you slip the bud into place. And that will actually grow away. That will grow away. You enclose it with a patent budding tie, or you could do it with raffia, but this is the you know the commercial way of doing it. Simply slip it around the back like that. Yeah. And there it, it remains until January, February of the following year. You and come along with your pruners and cut above the bud, and lo and behold, that'll you've come got out. A brand new and you've got a brand new rose. And all for nothing, because you can get these in the hedgerows if you like and root them in your garden. Brilliant, although you mustn't take plants from the wild. You mustn't take plants from the wild. But that's a way to get a plant that's yeah. no more. I don't think anybody would mind you pulling a briar off. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alistair. Now it's time to get fruity with Tom Lee. Strawberries do well in pots. This is a good example, good ripe fruit on it. Uh, potted up the runners in July and taken into the greenhouse in February. With a good nice warm spring we can actually be picking fruits in, uh, in May. Uh, one of the problems though with strawberries is slugs and snails. And here's a little device to help to offset these. Use a coffee, uh, coffee jar, jam jar or anything like this, polythene cup and fit the fruit truss in. Not only does it help the fruit to ripen, but it keeps the pests away quite nicely. So, save all your plastic bottles, uh, coffee jars and what have you to protect your strawberries from slugs and snails. Easy technique, so why not give it a try? Thanks, Tom. Now, this is my favourite part of the programme. It's where we throw it open to the public for our garden clinic. We've got Cameron and Willie standing by, ready to dispense top advice on how to get rid of these pests and diseases. Isn't that right? Yes, you like I that, hope Liz? so. I'll come talk to you up there, Cameron. And we've got Mary. Hello. Yes. Now, what's Hello. your problem? My problem, I've come to find out what my problem is. I've been given a present of this plant, mm -hmm. and I would like Cameron to tell me how to take care of it. So it's a Ramonda, an, al right. an alpine plant. Yeah. Well, one of the things about many of these very fleshy, soft-leafed alpine plants is that they do not like winter wet. So the problem in this maritime climate is how to keep them going over the winter. They like rain during the summer, but dry during the winter. So other than growing them in a specialist alpine house, they're very difficult things to do. 
So the best so this way is the to kind of thing that plant people would grow on a rockery. So it's thing they would grow on a rockery, but if you plant this straight into a rockery, it's guaranteed to die during the winter, unless you live in an area of extremely low rainfall. So but, this but Mary's got some gravel underneath, so she's been trying to give it a little bit better drainage even around that, its neck. The water will lie in here, and the crown will just rot out. So, in actual fact, the way they grow in the nature is that they usually grow in woodlands on very high alpine areas where they're covered by snow, so they don't get winter wet. But in this country, they're actually relatively easy to grow because all you simply do is that. Plant it on its side in a hole in a wall or in a rockery, so you've got two pieces of rock. You might, for example, supposing that was a rock, then there's another rock, you make a crevice in between them. Plant it on its side, fill it up with compost, and there you've got the plant sitting there. Have you got That's, any handy walls it to will, put it in? Yes, I have. Because that looks really pretty, Grow I think. Mean, you keep the snails flowers. from interfering with them. This one's not one for, uh, that's it's got covered much. There's very hairy leaves, hairy leaves yeah. and the snails don't yes. even bother it to any great extent. Mm -hmm. So you've got a nice wall planting. Yes. And it's not too late to say, but you can see there's a little bit of yeah. well, old leaves around there. Yeah. But So get planting, Mary. I'll leave you with Cameron for more good advice. We're going over to Willie now to see how he's getting on with you. Hello. Hello. Ahoya. This Ahoya is a nice, nice yes. house plant. And you've got a bit of problems with this on the leaves? Well, I don't know why it's got these spots. Um, it's had them since it was tiny, and it's, it's yards long now, and uh, above a window, across a porch. H have you had this for a long time? Yes. Uh, how long have I had it? Oh, a long, long time, yes. But I've taken cuttings from it, and they're, they're always spotty as well. It makes a lovely flowering plant, doesn't it, yes. where you've got these little kind of almost like um, jelly um, flowers, yes, and then they when are. they open out, you open out. Yes, yes. It's just starting to flower for this year. So it's a shame because it's such a beautiful plant. It's not, don't tell us it's going to die. It's not going to die. It's not fatal. No, and there's no bugs about it. There's no insects about it. Yes, if you're looking for red spider mites. It looks like mechanical damage. It is mechanical damage, I'm sure. I, I think if, if a little drop of uh, water strikes the leaf, it's just like a symphonia, you know, the, the leaves are sensitive to it and that you can't get this marking, which is spasmodic. You see, that one has no, no marking on it at all, hardly. I wouldn't worry about it at all. There's a little bit of disfigurement. But the, the growth's good on it and it's, it's relatively Somebody's happy, you know. It's Where have you actually got it? In the house? Well, the, the plant is in the corner of a room with glass on both sides uh, and there's wood up behind it. Mm -hmm. But the bits are above the windows. Because it's big, big climber, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And yes. Um, do you ever get water on the leaves? Well, I, I, I do on the bottom bit. I spray it, yes. But oh, I don't think right. the sun comes on as well. I don't think so, but Billy, Willie seems to think I do. Oh, you'll have to come and see. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bit of dissent here. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, well, I'm getting I mean, an invite. Now that you, you can watch out for that. And I will, and yes. See only spray it in the evening. Yeah. And if uh -huh. not, you'll have to come back and see us again. Anyway, I'll let you two battle it out. Thank you very much. Because I'm afraid we've run out of time for this show. I hope you've enjoyed it and well do done. join us again next time on Gorgeous Gardens. See ya. Yeah.